Hello, I'm Martin Kaiser. I'm a professor of hematology at the Institute of Cancer Research in London, and I also work as a specialist hematologist at the Royal Marston Hospital in London. I am going to speak about high-risk myeloma, which is the area of my research for many years now. Um, many patients of, get a lot of information when they get a new diagnosis of myeloma, and also later down the line, it's difficult to understand what the technical terms means. High-risk myeloma, more people will hear about that have to do with myeloma, have been affected by myeloma over the next years, because we're looking more uh, closely at this as a research community, because we know now we get the first glimpses of how we can treat patients better and how we can personalize treatment on the basis of risk status. There are many ways how treatment can be personalized. Of course, they can uh, include factors such as family factors, side effects of treatment, whether a patient can tolerate intensive therapy or not. But another factor that is more difficult to determine and that we need laboratory tests for is the risk status. And we mean by that effectively how aggressive is the myeloma. We cannot see that only by imaging tests or only by looking at the cells through a microscope. We need to do very difficult and complicated genetic tests, but that is not difficult for the patient. It's only for us in the lab to figure out how to do these tests. They can actually all be done on the material that's taken from a bone marrow biopsy, but it depends on how the lab is equipped and what tests it can run as to whether a full set of results is available or not. Now, next year, there will be, in 2025, there will be a new guideline by the International Myeloma Society and the International Myeloma Working Group on high-risk myeloma, and it will, I think, give more clarity on what we internationally consider high-risk myeloma, or as we call it, often standard-risk myeloma, so people that don't have myeloma with these features. These features will include genetic features, and actually, in particular, um, through our work that we have done over many, many years, most of patients that have high-risk myeloma are finding out about it through a genetic test, a so-called FISH test, but it can be done by newer methods such as next generation sequencing as well. And the feature is that some genetic aberrations in the tumor cells, not in the patient's genetic background, but in the tumor cells, have changed. So the normal genome has been shuffled in certain ways how they should not be shuffled in the tumor. And it can mean that chromosomes, so the areas where the genetic information sits break and are glued together in the wrong way, or that areas of chromosomes are missing and just getting lost, or actually they are gained, they have more of it around than there should be. And the areas that we're talking about are translocations. There are three main translocations that are having to do with high risk or more aggressive disease. This is the T414 translocation, the T1416 translocation, and the T1420 translocation. And then there are what we call copy number aberrations, which actually means that either parts of the genes are lost or there's too many of them. And there is, for example, the deletion of 1P, chromosome 1P is meant, that an arm of chromosome 1P is missing, or gain of 1Q, so there are extra copies of the long arm of the chromosome 1, or there are losses of the 17, chromosome 17P, also called DEL 17P. And there is one gene that is playing a role in many tumors, it's called TP53, that can also have mutations, as we call it, so that actually the genetic code is just changed in one place or several places. And the main group of patients, I think, that we now consider high risk are those that have two, any two of these markers together. Sometimes we call uh, this constellation double hit as well. And we also have kind of like introduced jargon in that if three of these lesions co-occur, we call, can, may call it triple hit. These are, of course, terms that may not sound adequate for a patient, but it's important for us because we have to speak in the laboratories and on, the, on a technical side about how we categorize the disease. So we need to have very technical terms. There's another test that unfortunately is not as widely available. What through our work we have found us is equally important. It's called gene expression risk testing. There are only few manufacturers that produce such a test. One of the signatures, for example, is called Sky92. And what we found out is it's independent. It's separate from the genetic information. There's actually quite a lot of patients that we don't diagnose correctly if we don't add gene expression testing to the overall test. Now, I don't want to disencourage people. Many people cannot access it at the moment, but I think it's an important thing that we get more access for patients to such a test. 
because it tells us additional information and it helps us pick up patients that we would otherwise miss and simply not know about. Now, it's all a long story already, but how did we use this information? We actually, several years back, thought about these patients deserve different treatments because we knew already through many trials they were never doing well with trials that we ran before, with treatments that we had around. And to be fair, unfortunately, still to date, many of them are not doing well. So we thought, although for many other patients, we might want to look at whether we can reduce the doses of treatments and maybe even be able to stop treatment, this is probably a group where that will not work and where we actually need to find a way how to give treatments so that they don't cause too many side effects, but still are more intensive to keep the treatment controlled. This is what we did in a trial called Optimum MAC9, and the trial was started quite a while ago. To find out whether patients have really done well long-term, you need to wait for a long-time follow-up, and this is what we're presenting at this meeting. We're showing the five-year follow-up, so patients have now been, on average, five years on the treatment, some were even on it for seven years already, uh, and we've compared the outcome of this trial to a treatment that is pretty similar to what we do in standard care today. Now, the trick of this treatment is that the patients stay on three drugs for nearly one and a half years longer after a stem cell transplant than they do at the moment. At the moment, we consider the start of treatment important. We do a, combine a lot of drugs at the start, then we do it an autologous transplant for younger patients. And then we drop the dose. We actually just go to one drug. And that is the time when most patients with aggressive disease, unfortunately, already start to relapse. That's why we actually intensified the treatment at that stage. But we actually intentionally said, let's not give these doses uh, at the maximum dose. We actually want to find the right dose for every single patient and allow dose reductions in the trial. That worked very well. What we have now seen with the five-year follow-up is that on the one hand side, still less than half of patients have had their relapse, whereas with standard of care treatment, only less than a quarter were still in remission. So 75% of patients of the standard treatment already had their disease come back, whereas 60% were still in a remission in the Optimum Mark 9 trial after five years. But what is even more important is that we now have an overall survival benefit. So unfortunately, uh, the majority of patients had already seen the disease not only come back, but a lot of patients already died with aggressive disease after five years. And we have probably reduced the risk by about 50% of overall survival for these patients. So actually patients are living longer if we give such intensified treatment. And not only a short duration, it might be that they live twice as long with this intensified first-line treatment than with standard of care treatment. Now, that is of course a very hopeful message in a field that inherently is unfortunately in the first instance bad news for patients, but there's a lot of hope in there because we're starting to understand how we can, can we make patients' life better? How can we design even intensive treatments so that patients can continue them without having too much impact on their life. The patients I'm looking after are doing really well on the ongoing treatment, I have to say. And uh, I think it also allows patients to get all the benefits of treatments that are now in development that might come about in three or four years' time uh, at the time when their disease then relapses to benefit from the new armamentorium of treatments that we have. In that group of patients, we are still learning more through having done all of these tests, genetic tests, gene expression tests. And we do see that some patients, for example, those with triple hit genetics, still would benefit from other treatments. Their disease still came back early. But on the other hand, the patients that only had two genetic markers and no gene expression risk marker, they did phenomenally well. Nearly all of them stayed in a remission for over five years now. So by doing more of these diagnostic tests, we can probably really give patients personalized advice in the future. What is the right dose of treatment for your disease to stay in a remission. In the consolidation phase, we combined actually drugs that are very widely used, daratumumab, bortezomib, and lenalidomide. So drugs that we normally use up front in the induction treatment, but we uh, space them out more. So if, for example, the bortezomib could be given once a week and people could dose reduce it. I think it's more important what we learned through this trial that you stay on all three drugs, even if on lower doses, 
and maybe even if you have a week's break extra in between, then stopping one of the drugs. So our main message is rather stay on three drugs, even if at reduced doses, than go down to two or only one drug. So we are, um, of course, not leaving the results where they are. We're actually writing guidelines. We have published a guideline from the British Society of Hematology, and uh, there is one uh, global guidelines are on the way as well. So I think if a patient is diagnosed with high-risk disease, it would be really useful to speak with their doctors and their treating teams. Ideally, even earlier, think about whether as many diagnostic tests can be done when the di first bomber biopsy is taken. We found out it can sometimes make sense to have a second test if not the right tests were done in the first round. For as long as there is tumor around, we can still get a better diagnosis. But then we can give advice on how to treat better. Not everyone will be able to access the triplet consolidation therapy worldwide. We're working on better access, and I think it's down to physician communities, patient communities, to advocate that everyone gets access. But I think definitely have a conversation with your doctor and your treating team, because your per treatment could be personalized for you.